you can see the efforts they are going or taking, even going as far as decreasing the arbitrage premium on the Shanghai Gold Exchange to really make it look like they stopped buying it. But in essence, what did it do? It, it drove the price down. And the Western media, who's so stupid as it pertains to telling us what's really happening, well, they were all over, you know, Reuters and, and all of the news channels were all over the fact that Chinese stop buying gold, and that's got to be bad for the gold market. You never hear anything positive. It's always, even if it is positive, it's spun with a you know a little bit of uh, whipped crap on top of it for dessert. And and they never ever are bullish about gold because it is the antithesis of the system. So the media, after 18 months of, of the Chinese finally updating their numbers repetitively and they stop, they're all over it saying they stop buying. China's central bank didn't buy any gold for a third straight month in July as the precious metal surged to a record high. Bullion held by the People's Bank of China was unchanged at 72.8 million troy ounces at the end of last month, according to official data released on Wednesday. This is the third month of no reported purchases. The central bank ended an 18-month buying spree in May that helped drive bullion strength. Obviously, China's pausing of official gold purchases was fake news. In fact, the opposite is true. The false story caused some anxiety, which may or may not have contributed to lower prices. Andy Schechtman, CEO of Miles Franklin, shares that throughout his 34-year career, there has always been skepticism about the accuracy of China's reported gold production numbers. He firmly believes China has deliberately understated its gold holdings, aligning with the narrative the IMF and the Bank of Montreal shared. According to him, China's reported numbers have often been understated despite China's claims of producing 300 to 500 metric tons annually. He states that KZ Jansen's article exposes China's claims of stopping gold purchases as false, with data showing they continued buying. Based on fundamentals, Schechtman considers China's move likely strategic, especially since the BRICS new currency is partially gold-backed. Additionally, after 18 years of development, the BRICS initiative is rapidly gaining momentum and accelerating as it nears its end. Apparently, it will be the BRICS currency everyone has been discussing. The problem is that it will only be 40% backed by gold and 60% by BRICS currencies. Now we present the clips of Andy Sheckman's insights from his recent interview. Before we continue to delve into this discussion, please subscribe to our channel and activate the bell icon for timely updates. They were convincing in the way they did it by reversing the arbitrage situation with gold on the Shanghai Gold Exchange. Silver is still is offering that arbitrage, but uh, right around uh, the end of July, we, we saw, in fact, COMEX gold futures were actually a little bit higher than the Shanghai prices. And that fell in line with what they were trying to do. Um, and look, first of all, just to recap some of the things I've talked about before about this, before I tell you uh, what I read about it really being false and, and evidence of it, is that for my whole career, everyone said, you can't believe what, what they're telling you. They It's been known that they're the largest producers in the world and they make or produce between three and 500 metric tons a year. You just add that up for the last 25 years and, and you're well above the numbers of 2,600 metric tons or whatnot that they tell us. But most of my career, I mean, Donegan, I've been doing this for 34 years, and I can remember vividly most of my career, everyone saying the numbers that the Chinese are telling us, and usually it was stuck at 1,200 metric tons for, I don't know, for a long time. You can't believe it. They're, they're not updating the numbers. You have the IMF saying their numbers are Fugazi. You have the head of, of uh, um, research for Bank of Montreal said their numbers are massively understated, and they are understated. They have been. Why would they want to be forthright? In particular, when we see the, the new unit settlement currency that has been evidently, according to Delma Rousseff, the head of the BRICS New Development Bank, agreed on in principle 40% gold backing. Why would they want to be honest about how much gold they're buying? There was an article that, that I read, and uh, I think it was from Kuz Jansen. He's a hell of a researcher. And he said, because the bullion banks take care of the gold transport, for the PBOC, the shipments from London to Beijing are disclosed in UK customs data. The customs data reveals that the PBOC continued to buy gold in May when it communicated to the market, it discontinued buying at it. This is the thing. You can see the efforts they are going or taking, even going as far as decreasing the arbitrage premium 
on the Shanghai Gold Exchange to really make it look like they stopped buying it. But in essence, what did it do? It, it drove the price down. And the Western media, who's so stupid as it pertains to telling us what's really happening, well, they were all over, you know, Reuters and, and all of the news channels were all over the fact that Chinese stop buying gold, and that's got to be bad for the gold market. You never hear anything positive. It's always, even if it is positive, it's spun with a, mm -hmm. you know, a little bit of uh, whipped crap on top of it for dessert. And and they never ever are bullish about gold because it is the antithesis of the system. So the media, after 18 months of, of the Chinese finally updating their numbers repetitively and they stop, they're all over it saying they stop buying. And I said, that's, that's just a lie. I've been saying that on your show and everyone else. They're not stopping buying. In fact, uh, the, these, these export numbers prove it. But I think people need to understand that this is an all-out rush, and when you see the effort that they are going to, like going through Latin America and paying double what everyone else will pay for unrefined ore in silver and silver concentrate to ship it home, tons per, I mean, tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of this stuff, the cost of shipping it and refining it is, it, it, they're okay with that. They've been mining gold um, in, that has been very uneconomical for a long time using our trade in balance, and so to them, it's money. And to them, they see the big picture. They think in terms of, of decades. Now, the BRICS has been going on for 18 years. This is not a just a, a trend that is just beginning. And like you said at the onset here, things are spinning faster and faster and faster. I use that toilet paper roll analogy all the time. They are spinning. From a technical perspective, Andy Schechtman emphasizes that the revaluation of gold might be a viable strategy for central banks, especially as the global shift away from the U.S. dollar gains momentum potentially driven by coordinated efforts like Operation Sandman. In the current situation, he recalls that Klaus Knott, the head of the Dutch Central Bank, mentioned in 2022 that their gold revaluation account holds over 20 billion euros. However, it's not counted as equity. Gold prices have continued to hit fresh highs in 2024 due to various factors, from escalating geopolitical risks and the interest rate outlook to budget deficit concerns, inflation hedging, and central bank buying. Traditionally. A weaker U.S. dollar and lower U.S. interest rates increased the appeal of non-yielding bullion. However, a significant decoupling emerged in early 2022, and gold's relationship with U.S. real yields broke even further this year. Regarding the U.S. debt crisis and inflation concerns, Sheckman concludes that revaluing gold might be a crucial strategy, especially as alternatives to U.S. treasuries emerge and gold continues to outperform. Let's get back to the interview. On every balance sheet, um, across the globe, the gold in central bank balance sheets is held in what's called a revaluation account. And it's weird. The way that they have the rules set up, I'm not sure really why they do it this way, but they have the gold in their, in their balance sheet on the asset side and the revaluation account, which mirrors it on the liability side. The rule is you can't offset a liability with your gold. And for whatever reason, it's still valued at 35 bucks an ounce across all uh, of Europe, as an example. Um, the Bretton Woods number. Now, I'm not sure I used to know. I mean, it's been so long that I, I why they moved the U.S. price up to 42.22. I don't remember exactly why, but suffice it to say, the official price in the United States is 42.22 on the books. You know, you got the head of the Dutch National Bank who keeps talking about this. He keeps talking about revaluing gold. I think I can pull up here really quick. I think, bear with me. I'm going to do this as fast as I can. I just read something today from it. He says, um, uh, let's see, the, the head of the, um, his name is Klaus Knott. And in October of 2022, he is the head governor of Dutch Central Bank. He said, the balance sheet of the Dutch Central Bank is solid because, make this bigger so I can actually read it, uh, is solid because we also have gold reserves and the gold revaluation account is more than 20 billion euros, which we may not count as equity, but it is there. Now, it's interesting to understand that when we talk about the revaluation account, why do they give it that name, I guess, first and foremost? Why would they give it the name of a revaluation account if it wasn't something that they noticed? And it's option number four, right? And option number one for the Fed would be to inflate the way all governments have done. And option number two would be to default. Option number three I focused on for the last four years, and that was um, incite the world to no longer trust the United States, to no longer have a need to use the dollar for oil, to sign an executive order to go green, to stabilize the country, 
weaponize the dollar in the treasury market and have everyone dump dollars. There's something called Operation Sandman that people should Google. Over 100 plus countries in theory, and I don't know how true this is or not, but Mike Adams sure thinks it is, and he's a smart guy, that they've all agreed at one point to uh, flip the switch. And it would happen at night is the way that it's written down, uh, the night of the switch, they call it, where in unison, they will all dump U.S. dollars and treasuries. Now, if all of a sudden Project Enbridge and the unit token get ratified and it comes out in October, I mean, it is not beyond the scope of my imagination to see that come to fruition. The slowly, little by little by little by little divestiture of dollars and treasuries, which we have seen, is positioning. And the accumulation of commodities like gold, which has doubled the performance of the 10-year treasury for 25 years with no counterparty risk, it's happening. So all of these countries, and we're supposed to be the United Kingdom, is, is now going to be the biggest purchaser of our treasuries, along with Ireland and the Cayman Islands. I got some oceanfront real estate to sell you in uh, Minneapolis, if you believe that that really is legit. Um, it's not legit. I mean, Jim Willie says they're paying them under the table. I don't care what it is. One broke nation buying the debt of another broke nation is just not really smart. And it shouldn't be even considered an asset. But it is, and it won't be the way things are going. It looks like the way that if indeed the unit comes about and, and you don't need to hold treasuries because gold is outperforming it with no counterparty risk and will be the primary component of a new settlement currency, you don't need to hold dollars either that are being inflated away by $100,000 a second. One, two, three, four. That's a trillion dollars every hundred days. A hundred grand a second has been pissed away and bankrupting your grandchildren and my children and all of these people that are working their tail off right now only to be indebted by, by uh, fiscal irresponsibility. So the dollars days are numbered ultimately as are the treasury. I do believe that. So as we talk about the gold revaluation account, to me, that's option number four. You just revalue the price of gold as high as it possibly can go uh, legitimately and, 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 and write off your debt. As China's strategic decisions regarding gold reserves unfold, the potential for significant shifts in global financial dynamics becomes apparent. How might China's continued gold accumulation and the rise of the BRICS currency influence gold revaluation and investment strategies? How do you foresee the role of gold evolving in the global financial system? And what impact might this have on traditional investments and currency stability? Drop your thoughts in the comment section below. If you find this video informative, don't forget to support our channel and turn on notifications to stay informed about our latest videos. See you in the next video.